Hello, everybody, and welcome to Championship 365, a new show here under the Football 365 banner. And I don't quite know how to word this, but Football 365 in some kind of <clears throat> Avengers Assemble, a collection of the good and great, or some would say the most irritating people that talk about <laughs> the championship. Certainly my Twitter tells me that. Anyway, um, have brought uh, some championship creators together for the coming season. We're going to be doing a bit of writing, a bit of talking, uh, some video stuff. It's going to be fantastic. Um, and you can find out all about that over on football365.com. This is Championship 365, which we think is going to be a weekly show. Uh, for the time being, because uh, we're going to be moving across to the Planet Sport Network, for the time being, we're going to just shoot this down our respective feeds and we'll tell you more about where the show is going to end up. First of all, let's do some introductions, although we are in the presence of greatness here, so you probably know who these people are. Although one of them hides behind the podcast format, but we have seen him on video a lot. Welcome from the marvellous second tier podcast, Justin Peach. Avengers Assemble, am I am I picking that right or just building my part too much here? No, I'll take Avengers Assemble. Bit of bit of a championship hero. It, you know, it makes sense. Bit, bit of gloating here from me, but you know, I'll take it. I'll take it. Do you want to be Iron Man with a big glass-fronted flying house suit <laughs> i mean hiding behind the visor yeah absolutely no one wants to see my face but you know you're gonna see a lot more of it so <laughs> <laughs> so get used to it yeah yeah <laughs> um if you want a club together to buy justin maybe like an iron man mask we don't, <laughs> don't want to see his face there you go um and down the bottom there he predates all of us he's like our father um <laughs> mr mr championship youtube guru uh Ben HD, how are you doing, Ben? I'm very well, thank you. Uh, very excited um, about the upcoming season and what we have here. Um, I think it's going to be quite a bit of fun to come. Should we just do complete transparency here? So I get away with this easily because you can see the Ipswich scarf means I have no dog in the fight <laughs> whatsoever. Um, Justin, if you happen to have a um, predilection towards any certain championship team based on birthrights and uh, support, who would that be? Uh, well, it's, it's Derby County, and obviously we're we're gunning for promotion this season. So I'm I'm looking forward to uh, I'm looking forward to the upcoming yeah few months. Come on, Derby always finish in the playoffs, don't they? And uh, Ben, I I think we all know your um, northwest leanings. Yes. Yeah, Preston North End for me. Um, I'd love to be optimistic about the season to come, but out of all three of us, who knows? It might be our year. Hey. Uh, just to take this away from the championship for one second, Ipswich are literally aiming to be the Wolves under Nuno of League One next season. So I'm sure they will find an innovative Ipswich type way to mess that up at <laughs> some point. But yeah, it does. Um, yeah, I'll say no more in my cautiously optimistic. So if you look at the crawler down the bottom, you can see um, we are going to have a quick look ahead at the championship. Um, we won't go, look, we could talk eight hours on that. We won't go into. Um, Massive detail, but the guys are going to pick out a club they're optimistic and a club they're pessimistic about. Um, shall I ban you from talking about your own club in that? Have a, have a think about that. That might be that might be a way forward. Uh, we're going to have a look at the manager's job security because history tells us that ten championship managers will not be here next season. That's just what the numbers say. Uh, we're going to try and figure out who's at the head of that queue. We're going to look at a head-to-head, -head, a nice matchup on the first day between Scott Parker, Valerie and Ishmael and Bournemouth and West Brom. And we're going to make a few first round predictions with it being just around the corner. And with that being said, we will get into our first segment. OK, we're going to play, um, we'll call it glass half full, glass half empty. So... Let's go for your glass half full. So I want you to pick out one club that you think might have grounds for optimism. Obviously, there's context here. Some teams have parachute money. Some teams have just come up from League One. Some teams kind of outperformed themselves last season. Justin, can we come to you first? 
which club, if you were a supporter of, would you have reasonable, non-ridiculous tribal supporter <laughs> um, influenced um, optimism about? I would edge towards QPR. Um, and that's mainly down to how they finished the season last season, how strong they finished the season last season, uh, how they've recruited uh, in the summer, how early they recruited as well. I think that's such an important cog into uh, building a playoff potential side is getting recruitment done quite early. And the likes of Samfield, I know he's injured. Um, the likes of Samfield came in early. Charlie Austin was announced early. They've added Stefan Johansson as well, which is a massive, massive uh, plus for them. Uh, and and Lyndon Dykes' form as well was was ridiculously good towards the, the end of the last season. McCallum, um, and, yeah, and McCallum. Uh, Ryan pointed out to me yesterday, actually, my my co is Ryan on, on the second tier, that I, I completely forgot that he joined QPR, Sam McCallum, and adding him into that mix uh, and how they attack and how well they use the wing backs is such a good addition, such a good addition for for QPR, and he's going to add something a little bit different to them going forwards. Um, and and there's the likes of Rob Dickey, Johan Barbe, very good partnership at the back, and then Jordi uh, Dewice as well. It's a really good squad, a very, very good squad, and I think one that might go under the radar a little bit, although I hope it doesn't. I hope it gets the applaud it's, it needs because it's a very talented team. What's your take on Mark Warburton then, Justin? Because obviously he has this reputation playoff in a first season hmm. at um people forget that about the Brentford story that they <laughs> first season up they actually got in the yeah, playoffs and yeah. then it was the the very steady rise look forest was forest and anyone only ever lasted 9 months at, at hmm. that point enough to sort of glasgow rangers is he is this now a potential career peak do you think for warburton I think so. Um, and the funny thing was, at some point last season, and it was during QPR's terrible run, because they had a bad first half of the season last season, um, I, 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 was, I wasn't I was angling for Warburton to be sacked, but I was surprised that they didn't part ways, essentially. Um, but then he turned it around the second half of the season. What they've done now is they've put together a, a, a top six side, essentially. And as you say, a career peak for Mark Warburton. I don't know how good a banker he was. Or trader he was. <laughs> that might have been a career peak for him um, back back when he was um, doing that before football. But as a as a manager, certainly it's 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 going to get to uh, a peak for QPR, especially if you get him into the playoffs. Yeah, I've st- I've spent the last five seconds trying to do a Wolf of Wall Street reference. <laughs> Best I've come up with the Wolf of Westfield because it's right next to the stadium. Might work. Yeah. That went down to the <laughs> church, didn't it? Uh, so QPR in there, reasons to be cheerful. Um, part three is part three for um, Warburton, isn't it? Ben, um, you pick out a club um, that might have some reason to be optimistic this season in the championship. Yeah, I'm, I sort of hate myself for what I'm about to say here, but I can't help but feel like Black Bull have a few reasons to be optimistic coming into this new season. Um, I think it's a club that's trending upwards at the moment. Um, and under the current regime that they've got going, I can't help but feel like they will be the strongest out of the three teams that are coming up this season. Um, I think that Neil Critchley is really building something there at the moment. Um, in terms of league finishes to the season, Blackpool were absolutely fantastic in League One. You know, they sort of held back a little bit with that poor start to the season. Um, I've been really impe- impressed by the recruitment so far. Uh, I think that Neil Critchley has got links to people. I think that before the addition of Richard Keogh, the average age of their other incomings this summer was about 22 and a half years old. Um, so it's a really young group of players that's coming up. Jerry Yates has just signed a new contract with them, which I think was massive. Um, he was being linked with away um, and move away to a few clubs before that. And yeah, I can't help but feel like Blackpool may stir things up next season, which as a Preston fan, I sort of hate because I'm nervously looking over my shoulder at the moment. Are you doing that like Freudian ego protection thing here, Ben, where (laughs) just outline the worst case scenario? Um, Look, Jerry Yates was uh, fantastic last season, wasn't he? And I remember watching the playoff finals and um, the lad from Everton, whose name I'm forgetting, that was on loan uh, up front. Was that Sims? Yeah. Sims, thank you was up yeah. front with him, and it, it was very attacking. Will Yates, because let's be fair, um, there's a very obvious correlation between the bottom of the table and lack of goals every season, yeah. every league. Will Yates um, do it at championship level? 
Well, that will be the interesting thing um, because he didn't really get that chance to sort of do it at Rotherham last time. You know, they were fairly happy um, to let him go to Blackpool at the time. And it'll be interesting to see if Critchley is going to be quite adaptable to the system um, for coming up to the Championship now. Um, you know, I remember Preston sort of had a similar situation when we were promoted from League One. You know, we had Joe Garner at the time who was just coming off the back of like a 30-goal season or something stupid like that. But when we came up to the championship, you know, Grayson made the decision to go much more defensive and he perhaps didn't get as many goals that season. I think he got eight or something like that. But uh, he was still playing that role up front for the side. And I think that the spine of sort of players that they've got, there is a fair bit of championship experience in there. If Joe Garner plays for your club, you absolutely love him. <laughs> Otherwise, oh, just all no. All-time favourite. I love the guy. Yeah, <laughs> just, absolutely. He was, he was fantastic, yeah. Um, right. Anyway, let's get Justin moaning about Derby. Hope, uh, sorry. Let's go on to our um, clubs that we're maybe a bit glass half empty on here. Justin. The obvious one would be Derby, but I'm actually going to edge towards Reading. And the, re yeah, the, the reason why is they've obviously they've lost Michael Elise and Omar Richards, which are two big losses. Michael Elise creatively was just insane uh, for a 19 year old it was ridiculous the numbers he produced um and as well as that Yaku Mate is injured he's done his ACL so he's, he's going to miss the majority of the season so they're, they're down to Ajaria and Swift as the two senior creators uh essentially and Lucas Shaw uh, as I say has lost um a lot of his supply uh and his link up with Elise was was very effective last season and as well as that his form dipped at the end, towards the end of last season, and defensively, when they lost Morrison, they looked a lot worse off. And as well as that, they've got well, they, they've got the transfer embargo, haven't they? I think soft one at the moment. Yeah. So they, yeah, so they can't pay fees for anybody, and they can't replace Elise. That they, they, they haven't bought anybody in as such. So for me, going from a, a seventh place finish, it should have been a playoff, a playoff uh, top six finish. And for me, they're going, they're going to dip this season towards the bottom half of the table, purely down to that. I find it really interesting because that mirrors your QPR prediction. Essentially, mm. you had this insane start last season with 22 points in eight games. And mm. then it was kind of really for... So if we take eight games, 38 games worth of pretty much mid-table form. Yeah. Um, can I throw the caveat in? Because I know we'll get comments from Reading fans about, yeah, about the injuries um, yeah. last season and there were Swift out for ages and had to mm. use Elise more than perhaps they wanted to. And Liam Moore was out. As you mentioned, Morrison was out. Um, any mitigating factor there or um, can you see the can you see the drop-off? And also, is there um, are they one of the teams possibly, I don't want to make this all about money, um, heading towards um, a potential tricky copy of the accounts? Well, you know, if we were to speculate, it might be an issue. It's, it's haunted Derby for a while now and it's come to fruition and the same thing could happen to Reading. We all know how much of a dis, uh, uh, sort of the disparaging uh, costs are for, for Reading in, in terms of how much they spend on wages compared to their income. It's quite quite a big, significant difference um but as you say the the injuries are an issue but squad depth is a massive thing for the championship and if you've got quality squad depth it helps Lucas Shaw getting injured last season George Pushkas stepped up was he as good was he as effective he, he wasn't essentially and um I think that's where they're going to struggle if they do pick up injuries defensively they look okay but it's those attacking positions Lucas Shaw gets injured Ajaria gets a knock John Swift's out for three months of the season again they're in a bit of trouble Interesting. Uh, ben, on a team you might a bit of um, have a bit of pessimism about, or is there a tap-in open goal for you here? <laughs> I'm going to avoid that tap-in uh, <laughs> just for now, but I am going to keep it in Lancashire for my pick because I can't help but feel like Blackburn Rovers um, at this point in time is an interesting team to pick up on. I'm sure that when we get into talking about the job security um, of the managers that we've gone over, um, a similar name might crop up um, in that one as well. But 
listen, I felt like last season was a massive underachievement from Blackburn um, and the resources they sort of had there at the time, you know, pro- perhaps one of the best loan players in the league in Harvey Elliott, um, a prolific goal scorer in Adam Armstrong. And to finish where they did in the bottom half of the table, where for me, that squad was easily capable of challenging for the top six. It leaves them in a bit of a sticky situation now. Obviously, Elliot's no longer there. We've got the whole situation surrounding Adam Armstrong. I can't help but feel like that Armstrong situation could be pivotal to what ends up happening um, with Blackburn this summer. He's only got 12 months left in his contract, so Blackburn need to make a bit of a decision about this. I think that in their ideal world, they get a bit of a bidding war going here. Um, you know, We've sort of heard the figures that they want of 20 million plus for him. Um, that would be great because obviously Newcastle have that 40% sell-on clause with him. But the danger then, you know, Preston found themselves in a similar situation last season with all the sort of out-of-contract players we had. None of them ended up going in the summer and we ended up losing, you know, Ben Pearson and Ben Davis for peanuts in the end for what they um, were actually worth. So Blackburn are a team who, if they do continue this trend down, they'd lose Armstrong, they don't adequately replace him in that side. Maybe, maybe struggles could be on the horizon for them. Interesting. Yeah. Every time I looked at Blackburn, Ben, I would look at the metrics and they remind me of Norwich before Norwich were good, where they completed loads of passes, had loads of shots. And if you didn't look at the most important metric, not the only important metric, but the most (laughs) important metric of the scoreline, you know, you would think they're not far off something clicking. But I think I'm with you. If um, Armstrong goes, and this could happen really late in the window, couldn't it? Because that's the problem. Yeah, everyone's playing poker in this market, aren't they? And it may even be attached to this ridiculous cascade of Harry Kane or Jack Grealish money down. So, yeah, there could be trouble in September, Ben. Yeah, and I can, listen, I can't help but feel like there is real potential with that squad. Um, you know, they've got a crop of youngsters who are coming through at the moment. Tyree Stolen, who we lost from our academy to Rovers, I think is a brilliant um, young talent that's coming through at the moment. But without the sort of right management above that to sort of knit that all together, you end up getting nowhere. I think you've given us a perfect segue to <laughs> our next segment there, Ben. You absolute beast of a pro, you. <laughs> Right. So the shout went out yesterday amongst um, our little disparate group of uh, championship nerds, frankly, um, (laughs) to rank the job security of all the managers in the league. Um, I haven't done my numbers. I did this before and it was something like every three weeks or something, a championship manager on paper. I know they all group around the international breaks and then the end of the season, don't they? But we will see, I'll say 10, 10 of these managers go and probably we'll see one of them go. When is that first international break? It must be October, looks like. Oh, no, there's one at the start of September. Um, October the 9th might be a D-Day mm-hmm. that someone will be gone by, I think. So what we'll do, we'll reveal our ranking list at the end, but there were some outliers um, in this. So we've kind of tried to pick the average and whatnot. And I suppose I should address the first outlier because I had Blackpool manager Neil Critchley much higher in the um, in the rankings than everybody else. So if I may try and justify that, I just feel whatever happens at Blackpool, even if they finish bottom, that he will not be sacked. Um, on the basis that, like you said earlier, Ben, it was a yeah. slow start last season, a kind of un- unlikely-ish promotion. I know they're we- fairly well resourced in League One terms, but I think Critchley is um, is pretty safe. I have to say, and I think could, uh, and I'm not saying before anyone jumps on me that Blackpool will be relegated, but he's the <laughs> sort of boss that would stay in situ in terms of um, a project um, type manager um, if he does. Let's try and pick out a couple of your outliers here. Justin, you had Scott Parker very, very high up. Now, Scott Parker knew in at Bournemouth. Bournemouth went from how to Tyndall, from Tyndall 
to Woodgate. Mm. What is your defence in a seemingly chaotic setup for having Scott Parker so secure? Well, I think Bournemouth have been after him since January. And in that time, they could have picked up anybody. Wilder became available when he's the, he's the go-to man, isn't he, for, for managerial openings at the minute. Um, so I think that commitment to get Steve Carp, uh, Steve Parker is uh, Steve Parker, Scott Parker. <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking of Steve Cooper. I can't get it out of my head. Um, yeah, Scott Parker. He's that, gone. That, Let it go. He, he'll, he'll be back. Um, yes, yes, he will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that commitment to get Scott Parker. It, it was a it was a sort of a sixth month um, tirade to 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 go out and get him that shows a commitment to a long-term project there for, for Bournemouth. Um, that, as I say, they could have gone for anybody. Fulham went for Marco Silva, for example. Uh, Sheffield United went for Jukanovic. So that, that, as I say, that commitment to get Parker shows to me that there's a bit of a long-term project there. And it, and it seems to fit. I don't know why. It just, it just marries up nicely. And, uh, and, and with Eddie Howe, Bournemouth have got this commitment to, to manage it. Obviously, Tyndall and Woodgate over the last six months doesn't necessarily show that. But, I think it's more of a, a long-term how project going in that direction rather than the short-term let's get promotion sort of thing. Okay, decent argument. Um, ben, Huddersfield fans won't be pleased to see how low you've got Carlos Corber on. So my contention with your decision having him there, I think I had him higher. Is there not a sense at Huddersfield that they retooled, they went away from Cowley, obviously they didn't really have the benefit of the parachute payments that came in, they went off to the new owner. Is there not a sense that despite a couple of absolute tankings last season that they're in the start of a process with Corberon or do you think it's um, do you think it's a bit on a knife edge? I think he's a really interesting one um, because I think we certainly saw shades of last season of what he was trying to accomplish um, at Huddersfield, you know, along the season. I think they were like the fastest starters in the league, sort of like in the first 20 minutes, they'd absolutely blow teams away. And after that, there'd be a bit of a fall behind after that. But I can't help but feel like given the right tools to succeed, he'd be a really good manager and um, given sort of 11 technically gifted players who are able to perfectly execute his system because I see what he's trying to do. But at the end of the day, he's trying to sort of string this team together at the moment on free agents. You know, Jordan Rhodes has come in um, to be their man up front at the moment. I'm not sure stylistically how much of a fit that's going to be into their side next season. And I can't help but feel like if something was to happen again to Josh Caroma, if he was to pick up an injury or something like that, um, and they do get dragged into a relegation battle, regardless of the style and the project that he's trying to build at the moment, say Huddersfield are sat bottom of the table come November, I can't help but feel like the people above him there get a little bit twitchy after that, um, because championship survival at the end of the day um, is you know priority number one, isn't it? Mm. And they, they might go all the way back in a circle to what they had under the Cowleys in terms of... Exactly, yeah. Just draw some games and get away from the bottom, if you know what I mean. No, well put. Shall we go through our list from 24 to 1? And I'll try not to pause too many times. And this is the average of our think tank. So think of that what you will. We don't have a number 24 because, um, well... Tate might end up getting the Swansea <laughs> job, frankly, but um, who knows what's going to go on there. So, and I am literally going to pause after the first one because it's Wayne Rooney. Um, is this all his fault, though? Um, Justin, I know he's he's not had a good news week, has he? But mm. let's not really go into that. But um, there, there is surely an argument now. You could put Alf Ramsey, Bobby Robson, Pep Guardiola, Bill Shankly into Derby this season, and it would be tough. It yeah, it's it's a good argument to make. I was at first quite crit critical of Rooney mainly because of that run of form he had last season was just horrendous. It's sackable form for any manager. Might be Guardiola, could be the best manager in the world. The run of form that Derby had, you you, you should get sacked really. Um, but I, I'm I'm in the I'm in the boat of give him a chance, give him an opportunity, give him players. Uh, unfortunately, Derby don't have that, and obviously with. With the bad PR he's had this week, shall we say? I don't think I don't think it helps. And obviously, there's the Jason Knight scenario where he's put Jason Knight out for twelve weeks, which not only is he a, a good player, but he's also a saddable asset for Derby, which they need money. And if he 
can't complete a medical, he can't get sold, which isn't, again, it's not ideal for Derby. But yeah, for, for Rooney to be bottom of this list, I think it's quite telling for not only Derby's situation, but his ability that he's shown so far as well. I just want to put my tinfoil hat on now. <laughs> Rooney might be a genius. He might be like, I really need Jason Knight. <laughs> I said this, yeah. <laughs> Did you? How, how can I get past the transfer window and guarantee yeah, Jason Lou, Knight? Is... Louis Sibler's next. <laughs> no, oh, no, stop it. God, stop it. Um, right, so we had Rooney 23rd, Tony Mowbray, which you already mentioned, Ben, um, yeah. 22nd. Nigel Pearson, I suspect, and I'm thinking on behalf of others, that that might be more due to him just getting absolutely fed up with um, whatever's going on there and um, uh, there being a some kind of breakdown there. Um, and then, Ben, I want to come to you because it's Frankie McAvoy um, mm. in 20th. And is he not on a bit of a hide into nothing here? Because the bar is quite high for Preston generally, isn't it? They always manage to get around that top half despite never really spending that much. Yeah. And sometimes you worry about people who aren't big names. They don't they just don't get the um the extra time that others do. What are you what are you saying? Yeah, well that's that's the thing really because you know since we've been back up in the championship, I think we've been quite good really for giving managers time. And um, you know there were times under both Simon Grayson and, and Alex Neal where we had a really poor start to the season. We found ourselves in the bottom three after 10 games. And then after that, we always sort of back the process that we, you know, get up and finish in the top half come the end of the season. With McAvoy, it does feel a little bit different um, because he's so unexperienced um, as a number one. It does feel like if he doesn't hit the ground running with this side this season, he probably won't be afforded that time um, that both Neil and Grayson were. But I do also think as well that not just from the people above um, him, but from the fan base in general, I think there is less... Um, sort of pressure being put on McAvoy this season. You know, under Alex Neal, it was always top six challenge, top six challenge, top six challenge. Under McAvoy this season, there seems to have been a bit of a slump down from that. You know, the transfer activity so far hasn't exactly been like sparkling. Um, that squad we had under Neil has sort of come towards the end of its cycle with Ben Pearson, Ben Davis, Darnell Fisher, um, Jordan Hugel, Callum Robinson. You know, all those players have like moved on now. And this is a new group that's um, up and coming at the moment. So there does feel you know, from the Preston fans, like, we'll give McAvoy a bit of time here because I don't think anyone's really expecting us to be, you know, pushing the top six in the top half this season. I think we're all expecting a little bit of a boring season in mid-table. Mm, interesting. Uh, so, number 19 was Paunovic. I think you've already kind of touched on that, Justin. Mm. Uh, Corberon we've spoken about. Grant McCann, that's an interesting one to me. I, I had him much higher than that, but the think tank says 17th. I just feel the Alams have got a guy now. He's already been relegated with them once where um, a bit like Marcus Evans and Mick McCarthy, they've, they've got a guy where the kind of absentee owner can just go, right, go on and you do everything. I'm not. I'm, I'm, I'm going to hide for the next five years for the duration of your contract. Um, Michael O'Neill, 16th. Now, I, I had him much, much lower there. I, I think that's one club where if they take let's say four points from the first 10 um or 12 games where it's going to be like okay where is where is this going now uh, marco silva valerie and ishmael that's kind of understanding with the um expectation of the year one parachute teams if if they're not within two games of the top two then trouble ensues doesn't it lee Bowyer, chris hewton Reads well for Forrest, doesn't it? Where we would guarantee a Forest manager sack every January, <laughs> wouldn't we? Uh, Marcus Schott, Yukanovic, Parker. So uh, we're now going up into our most secure. Darren Ferguson, eight. Mark Warburton. Gary Rowett at number six. At number five, Mick McCarthy. And I'll echo my sentiments about owners and safe pairs of hands and let them get, <laughs> let them get on with it. Number four, Neil Critchley. And one of my favourite subjects is Neil Warnock, number three. Is this a case, Justin, of, look, it's, I, I know he'll probably still be doing it when he's 85 or something, but <laughs> it's the last job. Just just, just let him see it out now and let him go on his own terms. He deserves that, doesn't he, Justin? Absolutely. The man's a legend. You can give him anything. Give him the, <laughs> the, the keys to the championship. He deserves He deserves it. And as you say, his, his job's untouchable wherever he is, apart from probably Leeds, where the club was probably 
bigger than Warnock, but Warnock's bigger than Borough. And that might that might irk a few Borough fans, but let's be honest, it's Neil Warnock. What a go. Um <laughs> in second, um Ben, we had Mark Robbins, who everyone obviously ranked very highly. And I'm surprised that didn't come up. That I'm sure that was close on your lists of places to be optimistic. Looks like quite a good striking roster and a trend upwards at, at Coventry and a, a guy, I think he's got a couple of promotions now and a did he win the pizza trophy or the windscreen trophy or whatever it was when when he won it? I'm trying to think with Coventry, but he's certainly been hugely successful there, Ben, hasn't he? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think with most of us, he was right up there um, in terms of that list, in terms of sort of how long he's been in that job for. Um, and I think regardless of what happens there at Coventry, you know, they've had so much go on over the last 10 or so years. They finally now got that guy who they can put that trust into. And like you say, it does feel like um, something is coming along there now. Very interested to see how uh, Waghorn gets on there next season. I think he could be an interesting one. Mm, I did, sorry, I, I, I always say, please leave your bias at the door on my channel. I can't because I love <laughs> Waghorn for his one season at um, Ipswich. But yeah, it looks like, looks like there's some goals there. Um, by process of deduction, you have probably realised um, that... Um, oh, I'm, I'm just hearing in my ear that Justin had Robin's 13th. I did. Is that correct, Justin? What's that? Um, I Coventry are an interesting one, mainly because they're going back to the Ricos. Things are moving a little bit. So if Coventry are in danger of going down, would they allow Robins to, well, I say allow Robins to move on, sack Robins essentially? So I just think they're in that sort of bracket. And obviously the ownership situation still hasn't changed. So they might pull the trigger, they might not, but he is a safe pair of hands for Coventry. He is a talented manager, a good manager, and he's done so well with them. I just I just feel like if Coventry, they might want a bit more out of the, the team that they've got. And if if it's a slow start, they might move him on. So interesting, this safe pair of hands bracket, isn't it? When you in, <laughs> you, you, you realise you, you've, you've turned into Steve Bruce or um, Chris Hughes. You know, oh, Chris Hughes is involved <laughs> in that, isn't he? But do you know what I mean? These managers, this yeah. has been a long, long road for Mark Robbins now. Um, I was just going to reveal our number one, which is Nathan Jones at Luton. So I guess the feeling there is he's been away, he's come back, escaped relegation. 12th place. Is there no doomsday scenario at, at Luton where it all falls off a falls off a cliff, um, Ben? Or do you think it's um, too kind of headed forward there at the Kenny? Yeah, I mean, listen, anything can happen in the Championship, but um, it's a tough scenario to see at the moment. I think they are definitely one of those clubs um, who are trending up at the moment. And it's an interesting season that they're coming into. You know, there's been a bit of a sort of squad refresh with some of the players that have moved on. Um, and the players that they brought in as well, you know, some of a similar profile to what they usually go for. And then the likes of like the Cameron Jerome's and the Henry Lansbury's, um, who I think will be quite an interesting addition, you know. No longer got Dewsbury Hall, who was perhaps one of the best loanees in the league last season. So, uh, yeah, it'd be interesting to see if they can sort of rekindle that that old Henry Lansbury of, of previous days. There you go. So, in summary, the manager we thought um, most likely to um or with the least job security is predictably um at the um slight basket case we have at derby at the moment is wayne rooney and most job security nathan jones let us know what you think about that down there in them comments right let's just have a quick look ahead at our first round of games i know there's still a lot of water to pass under a lot of bridges in the transfer market um, and, frankly, at Swansea in terms of um, a managerial uh, hire before the season starts. But, look, we're, we're going early with this. This show will normally come out on a Tuesday, I think, but we're, we're just getting our ducks in a row and going early this week. So we're going to do it anyway. Justin, um, we have um, the first game back uh, the Friday night. It's got a lot to live up to after that. Luton and um, Borough game a couple of years ago, which was ridiculous, wasn't it? Uh, Bournemouth versus West Brom. Um, can you just touch particularly on two new managers and both want to ingrain their style and one is 10 times the speed of the other in terms of the pattern of play. Um, how do you see a first game between um, Parker and Ishmael playing out under the lights? It's, it's going to be interesting, isn't it? Because the continuity under Parker is much more similar to 
how it would be under Woodgate, Tyndall and Howe. Um, obviously under Howe, Bournemouth were a lot more attacking. They came a little bit more reserved under Tyndall and a lot more reserved under Woodgate where they played a 4-2-3-1. Billing was a number 10. But I think it's going to shift a little bit. But I still, I still think they have this patient style that Parker's instilled into Fulham. And it was quite pedestrian at times. It was very difficult to watch. And then you've got Valerie and Ishmael. And I've no idea how to describe his football compared to Scott Parker's, but it's literally... Mental. Yeah, Scott Parker's <laughs> Scott Parker's in the bus lane, whereas Ishmael's coming up on his Ford Mustang at 100 mile an hour. With no seatbelt on. With no seatbelt on and no airbags. Yeah, it is carnage. Um, <laughs> no, no insurance. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> it is utter carnage. And it's going to be such an interesting mashup because obviously there's two different styles of play, but they've all, you've also got how a West Brom's player is going to adapt to Ishmael's style of play because they've played a, a little bit patient under Bilic to a more defensive style under Allardyce to stay up to this attacking, direct, 100-mile-an-hour football. It's, it's, I hate saying it because it's a bit of a cliche now, but it's going to be such an interesting fixture. 100%. Uh, what, what, what do you think, Ben? Who can? Um, we're probably going to be able to tell more in September, you know, sort of game eight, game 10, who's getting there fastest. But in terms of an opening day matchup, does it almost favour the patient team rather than the team that's going to be wanting pressing for 90 minutes? I think perhaps, yeah. And it'll be interesting to see um, who's actually out there in terms of the teams, you know. You know, each of them have got some big players at the moment who are being linked with moves away, you know, Pereira's, Dan Jumas and things like that. Um, but I think it'll be quite telling, really, because I think that... A lot of us probably will be back in each of them to be, you know, right up there come the end of the season. Um, so it'll be an interesting test, first of all, to see where they're at at the moment and how this sort of process takes them along the season um, as their new managers sort of integrate the systems as the year goes on. Interesting. Let's go for some predictions then. So um, all I need is a home, away or a draw from you, Justin. I've picked out three games and we've got another interesting one. We've got Fulham. Um, in the first game under Marco Silva and the return of the conquering Mitrovic and Kearney and all of those guys, Bobby Reed, that tend to beat up on the championship on their biannual visit to come and see us against uh, Warnock, who does feel, look, I know, I know we, we're probably fans um, a bit too much here, but does feel like he's now coming into second full season and starting to build more of a Warnock looking squad it'll certainly be ready for Fulham won't he how do you see that one going home away or draw I'm going away this has got one nil win 20% possession one shot on target written <laughs> all over it sent a half from um from a set play exactly Mark Bowler with a coming off his ass <laughs> tremendous Ben Fulham versus Borough um are you are you having a slightly murky away win Perhaps, but this season, I really can't see past Fulham. Um, I think with the amount of quality they've got in that starting eleven, I mean, Borough's going to be an interesting test on the first day, um, whatever happens. I think I'll slightly sit on the fence for that one and go for a draw, though. You know, Walt could always pull something off, but Fulham, I think, will be strong. Yes, he can. Um, Justin, Blackburn versus Swansea. And... This is a very hard one uh, for you. So this is completely with the caveat that you literally don't know who the manager is and there will be a manager announced. um, Well, unless it's complete chaos there, there will be a manager announced before that game. And you mentioned um, sort of sinking ships and players going out. So no Cooper, no Gwaii. Grimes, I think, is linked Mm. with all and sundry. And of course, Ayu, who they've lent on for two seasons now. is, is it going to be a slow start for Swansea, home away or draw? Blackburn, Swansea. I'm going to go for a home win. Oh, Connor Roberts is out injured as well, so they've lost that right. dynamism down the right. So they, they've lost a lot of their outlets. So, yeah, I can only see a Blackburn win here. Ben? Yeah, I remember last season, Blackburn started this season at like 100 miles an hour, mm. didn't they, with the amount of goals they were scoring at home and stuff like that. So if we get something similar happen this, happening this season, yeah, we could maybe see them catch Swansea off guard. They are maybe quite prepared for this season. So I think I'll agree and go Blackburn for that one. And for our last one, we got one of the new boys. We've got to do it. It's Luton versus Peterborough. We'll come to Ben first. So Peterborough famed for producing strikers. They're going to come up with 
uh, Clark Harris, who scored a ton of goals in League One, and the returning all conquering when he was at Peterborough, Jack Marriott, who let's just be yeah. fair, hasn't done it in the Championship at all, has he? Um, <laughs> Peterborough are going to be fun. Are they going to get enough points, and how will they go at the Kenny on the opening day? Luton, Peterborough, home away or draw, Ben? Yeah, well, it's funny you mentioned that 3-3 three, three draw that Luton had on the opening day um, okay. a few years ago, because I'd love to see something similar happening in this game, really. Just a crazy sort of end-to-end basketball match. Um, and like I say, I do think Peterborough will be a lot of fun this season. But for this prediction, I think I'm a little bit more nailed down on Luton for this one. Justin? I'm going to edge towards a draw. This is one of the games I'm, I'm going to struggle to separate the teams because you always get the opening day. Sometimes it can be a bit chaos. Sometimes it can be a bit placid. I think Luton will try and nullify Peterborough's attack as, as much as possible. So, yeah, I'll, I'll edge towards a draw there. Brilliant stuff, guys. Right. I think we did it. I think we got to the end. That is our first Championship 365 show. Uh, so, as I said at the top here, the plan is, in the end, we're going to be ending up on the Planet Sport Network. But for the next couple of months, probably, we'll be going down um, other people's feeds. So... You're watching this on my channel at the moment. Ben, for the next show, where do people need to head? Yep, so you can head on over to Ben HD on YouTube to go ahead and catch next time's show. And for the show after that, where are we needing to head, Justin? It's at Second Tier Pod or the Second Tier on YouTube. And we're going to do a little round robin around all three of those. There's also been a Twitter set up for this, which is at F365EFL. We're going to go regular each week with our predictions as well. Uh, there is in the works, and I think it's nearly ready on football365.com, a predictions league. So I'm sure, boys, we're going to be roped under heavy duress into entering this and being embarrassed on a weekly basis. But um, what are you going to do? So um, there'll be more details about that, of course, at f 365 EFL and everything championship football 365.com. Again, this is our first embryonic show here. So do let us know what you want to see uh, and what you want to see covered. Because obviously we all cover this league and we don't want to repeat what we're saying in one place than the other. So uh, let us know your ideas and do go and support these two lovely gentlemen over at the Second Tier Podcast and at Ben HD's channel on YouTube. We will be back in about 10 days. I think it's going to go on Tuesday, the 10th of August. Um, this has been the Championship 365 show, and we will see you all very soon. Thank you for watching.